uh, Flotilla Friday, 2021, October 15th. Mark was just um, uh, thanking uh, Mark Antoine for the Hyper Knowledge Seminar this week, which yeah, is so great. You and Michael and Peter were there, so I have all the attendees. So actually great time for feedback. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mark. The, the, um, it was not the largest attendance. I'm thinking I may make another attempt at shifting times, but uh, let's see what happens. But I'm happy with how it turned out after I corrected the stupid mistake with the... Uh... <laughs> oh, but probably, Mark, you didn't saw this. I didn't put the slides at the first 20, for the first 20 minutes. I edited the video to reinsert them. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> which... <laughs> You, you made time. an interesting comment, which was, oh, it's, it's kind of good. We weren't distracted by the, the slides. Yes. Yes. Which yes. true. Yes. Well, uh, I guess the, the audio is self-sufficient. I, I try to use the slides as more of a springboard and not read, it, read them off. Yeah. So that way, the, in a way, it makes them more distracting, I guess, because there's not a perfect match between what I'm saying and the slide. <laughs> But it does mean the audio stands alone more. Okay. But yeah, so those are the goals I want to get into uh, the how in the next seminars. Uh, yes, it's still struggling with some aspects. Let's go. I'm going to be busy for the next two weeks. The but the really one of the really important things is uh, dealing with more atomic knowledge units and where they are and where they come from. And we're all dealing with atomic knowledge units and how can we share them? Uh, and what's in the atomic knowledge unit? Is it just text or is it something that more structured and what are the elements of structure? Right now I'm trying to decompose what's in the knowledge unit. And you and I have about 10 hours that we need to to vote on simply that topic. <laughs> so whenever, whenever you're ready, it's going to be exhausting um, and productive. <laughs> so um, uh, certainly, I have been uh, looking at what is the minimal unit of knowing in the semiotic tradition, which would be a sign in the kinds of knowing that are iconic. I recognize this, I don't recognize that. When you get to sign to sign relations, then that starts the indexical level of reference and it gets ridiculous very quickly in terms of making it exceedingly simple. But I can say Mark, Mark Antoine, those are two signs. And there's a relationship there, and that relationship is infinite. It's not something that can be unitized um, in terms of the practical life implications of one sign like chicken related to another sign like egg. It's just, it, it's this infinite problem and to unitize to say you know chicken rdf triple egg it's it's just a mess um and i would love to go deeper on this but um i'll just introduce that infinity of possible relations that um oh who wrote the Principia, not Newton, but uh, Russell. Right. So Russell was writing a book criticizing Leibniz. And so relations are infinite, but attributes can be finite. Um, and and it, I tried to search, I tried to read the book and, and actually extract that notion from what a, another philosopher told me, and I couldn't find it. Um, but I'm still looking. Um, and again, I don't want to derail this conversation. Yeah, 
it, it, it's a big conversation. Okay, my intuition, just the quick, quick response. Relations are infinite, but many of them are domain specific. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a finite set of epistemic relations that is fundamental, uh, of which you can make the domain specific. Well, not of which, but the domain specific are kind of subsumed on, under these, this limited set of epistemic relations. And, and that's what I'm after. Uh, exhausting. And, and, and as for the infinite number of relations, the other thing is there are nice catalogs out there. The, the Stanford's FrameNet, for example, is an extremely good uh, catalog of relations. Uh, it's not infinite, but it's sizable and significant. Uh, it's been worked on. Uh, there are infinite nuances that could be brought into such a catalog, but still. Uh, I'm a big fan of FrameNet and frame semantics in general. And I think there's a, there, there's a layer beneath that, which is probably not that big. You know, equivalence, difference, subclass of a few things. And that's the list I'm coming to. And point and I'm not done, but there's, I think it's not that long. Um, Mark and Twen, you mean uh, Berkeley for FrameNet? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. I think you're right. Um, Berkeley, Berkeley and Stanford are similar enough that they, they hate each other really well. Um, uh, the, the other the other list that's I, interesting, since we're into those lists, is the IML. You're aware of IML? Uh, I'll while I'm looking. Oh. oh, I see. It's ICSI, which is not exactly Berkeley. It's not. It's not exactly UC Berkeley. ICSI is kind of a separate group, and they're a great group to follow their talks. Um, they're in downtown Berkeley, and they're doing amazing things. And I highly recommend. Um, subscribe, you know, visiting their site and, and they've got recorded talks and um, they're doing all kinds of different um, AI and compu basic computer science research. So I, I, hmm. I think of Roger Shank when I think of frames um, and that dates me. Um, I, I haven't I, really looked. I think of Minsky recently. and I think a lot, I don't know if he used the, the name frames, but I think of psych and micro domains a lot. Mm -hmm. But you're right, Shank is one of the key references. And uh, Mark Antoine, you mean psych uh, CYC, um, Lynette's thing? Yeah. I thought it was Shank uh, Yankee. Am I wrong? I I don't know. I haven't got there yet. If, if you could correct it, that would be. Shank. I will check. Mm. Mm. I may be wrong. S C H N K. Yeah, Shank and Mendelssohn. And Adelson and yeah, just gosh. It's been a while. Um, hey, Vincent, how you doing? It's great to see your picture here. Yeah, well, it was uh, good. I am in the car on the way to the third well, wedding in the last three weeks. I'm kind of exhausted from traveling <laughs> and miss being at my computer desk, honestly. But uh, yeah, I'm doing good. I have been doing a lot of drawing and sketching and um, 
Illustrator on the iPad is incredible. So I've been doing a lot of really cool stuff on that. Um, I've been like trying to basically use the time away from my screens to like, yeah, bring more art stuff into my uh, repertoire. So I just started um, this kind of like sketching out different ideas that I've had. Like this is like information to knowledge, knowledge to wisdom. And <laughs> been working on, yeah, figuring out how to like every single like a building as a representation of that entity. So for example, like this is like the image for like a network or the image for a group. And then inside of a group, Um, you'll be able to like add different spaces. So like this is like an organization board and these are troves and this is like a resource library. And so making then how those data objects interact, you have buildings and then inside of buildings you have like data objects and inside like, <laughs> all of that um, and doing it in like a high enough fidelity that it can be shared on a screen and because a lot of it has been just like sketches which is like really terrible like <laughs> screen sharing sketches on zoom so that's been my like last three weeks endeavor which has been fun it's um it's wonderful and uh i can't wait till we can meet in person someday likewise yeah i'm in florida so uh, other corner of the U.S., but hopefully I'll be in the West Coast soon. You're always welcome at the Internet Archive. That's for sure. We have we have a place to stay if uh, if you need one in San. Well, that's you know extends to anybody. Um, we have some tiny little rooms um, that uh, um, if you check in, we can you know make them available for uh, anybody to stay. You know, maybe up to a week or so. We can check in any time we like, but we can never leave. <laughs> Depends, you know. The I, Hotel California, yeah. what's the name? I don't know. I, I think you could. People have left, let's put it that way. <laughs> How are you doing, Michael? I'm not bad. Uh, wouldn't mind a visit to the, to the Hotel California, but um, I'm, I'm good. Um, uh, been doing a lot of stuff with stuff, um, both um, personally and professionally. I um, might have brought this up before in the group, but but Pete definitely knows that um, when I was in Berkeley briefly, I was going through old collections of concert posters um, and my uh, father's um, books and just all kinds of stuff that, um, you know, I've always been an archivist and I have many tens of thousands of, you know, Mark, you and I have talked about this, but um, books and magazines and posters and LPs and comics and you name it. And, um, and the notion of what the value of that is and how that how that value can be shared and or, you know, the, 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 the knowledge value can be shared, which I know is close to, you know, your heart with the internet archive and, and also how the, the monetary value and investment value that collectors have can be distributed in some way uh, by a partial ownership and, you know, just having a lot of conversations with people about how to set up systems um, and networks around um, the sharing of stuff and discussions of, around stuff. Um, so yeah, um, my, my head is full of that and really interested in talking to people about that kind of thing. Yeah. 
talking about the San Francisco Bay Area, San Francisco, actually talking about San Francisco and music and stuff like that reminds me of <clears throat> seeing the, um, the Matrix, uh, the new Matrix movie trailer, um, which, which did this cool mind trick thing where um, they actually show the, the Alice in Wonderland book uh, in the trailer and they're playing the Jefferson Airplane song, White Air white rabbit um and and it's funny i'm old enough to kind of get it you know like oh yeah you know i know that song um and then it wasn't until i was like looking up how cool that was on the web to explain it to my kid who's you know in her 20s um that uh, jefferson airplanes like main venue the their home base was the matrix back in you know eight ashbury or wherever so it's like oh man this is awesome and with wachowski you know like double flip thing with i don't know it was very cool um peter you just pointed to Uh, issue I'm trying to name when it comes to knowing and knowledge, which is kind of the difference between poetry and prose. In a poetic kind of expression, I am reworking the notion of expression to have multiple different kinds of experiential, associational explosions that I don't create, but you create in your head. What, how, what's that name that gives us <laughs> art? You know, I, <laughs> I want to say qualia, but. Um, yeah, you know. ACM isn't helping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, I think there's many phenomena at play when uh, in this type of one is simply the cloud of connotation, right? In theory, a term has a denotation that designates this concept. And in reality, it also hints at all these other meanings for each term or for each expression. And good poetry, I think, one thing it does is juxtapose uh, expressions that connect at the connotation level in a way that they don't connect at the denotation level or that they connect differently at the denotation level. So that your, it triggers the connotation and creates a new connection between the connotation meanings. And at, some of that is just activating the connotation and activating the common connotation space. Like there's a kind of constructive interference between the, the common connotation space and the expressions. But that's trivial. The question is, does it create a new connection? It's not just activating what's common, but using that to uh, create a new connection between concepts. That is indeed an art. But um, there's no question in my mind that it's an art based on a mastery of the uh, all the multiple connotations, you know, all the, the, the whole cloud of connotations around each expression, uh, which is about, you know, how it's being used in culture and in different media. And it, it's, of course, very culturally bound, which is fine. But it's, but, but there is something more to it. I mean, there's the common, the, 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 the common hidden connotation, and there's the using that to create a new link. And here I'm a bit hand wavy, but there is something there. It's, 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 it blows your mind when it forces you to see things in a new light, in a new perspective. And that means you're using one uh, meaning to address another in a way you hadn't before. I don't know if that's describing what you were saying about poetry. 
we're, I don't know that we're going to, as you would say, come up with the canonical definition. <laughs> And, 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 and let's face it, this was desperately denotational and not uh, poetic. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a poet. I am. Um, I, I miss the so I miss the old San Francisco. Um, so I wasn't quite there for the hippie phase, but I was in San Francisco, like I think in the late seventies and then the 80s, and then the 90s, and then the aughts. <laughs> and at some point, um, the old San Francisco, you know, from the, the 60s got lost. So. There's a number of people who are in their 30s and 20s who came here, and uh, I forget if it was William Gibson who was talking about Seattle. You know, Seattle had this hype, and all kinds of people showed up, they found out that the hype was hype and they said, oh, fuck it, we're here. We'll just create it. And unfortunately, those people are much rarer than they were in the 90s and in the 80s and the 70s. But still, um, it happens and um, it's, it, it can be beautiful. Um, and I wish, you know, I, and basically COVID interrupted that. Um, and I'm not sure we, where we're going to go from here, but we're still here. So, mm. so the, the Internet Archive feels like a, a small oasis of old San Francisco. <clears throat> so I think that's cool. I, it reminds me, I was uh, in the south part of Japan uh, in a small city at a technical conference or something like that. And, and the evening we were having dinner and I was sitting next to a professor uh, who I think was living in Tokyo, and it's like Tokyo is so cool, you know. I was I, I was like ex super excited about Tokyo because it's a cool place, right? <clears throat> in the same way that New York is, or Montreal in a little way, or or um, Paris or something like that. So um, uh, so he's like, yeah, you know, the the new Tokyo is not the same as the old Tokyo. You know, if everybody from outside of Tokyo thought Tokyo was this certain kind of thing. So then they all moved there and it turned into the Tokyo that they thought Tokyo should be. But in doing so, it, it changed to be not Tokyo anymore. So <laughs> happens all over the world. <laughs> I heard this about the, the, the Portlandia myth that it became another self-fulfilling prophecy. That's kind of normal. I mean, you use a symbol as an attractor yeah. And it creates a reality. I mean, I don't want to go all uh, <laughs> Romney esque about this, but it's true. Symbols create reality. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Not quite at the Borghese well, level, but still. <laughs> the Plan Ugbar of Bistercius was one of my favorite short stories, if you're familiar with it. So, uh, I'll write it. Uh, it's, it's a story about people who create a story about a mythical world, a kind of secret society that creates a story of a mythical world. And everybody get, gets so engrossed in it that it becomes reality. Because, of course, reality is determined by perception, hence you can change reality. <laughs> Are you talking about the Borges story? Yeah, the Borges story. Okay. Clone Urbis something. Yeah, Clone Urbis something. That, that reminds me, I, I read a science fiction story, you know, probably when I was probably in the mid 70s or something like that. And it was it was a short story about this magical machine that would answer any question you had. Um, and uh, somebody somebody kind of tried tried to trace it back. It, it, I think it was an alien thing or something like that. But they thought what they were, you know, the, the, the naive assumption is that um, the interesting part was the knowledge that the machine had or the magic thing, whatever it was. But it was actually um, the machine had all this knowledge and it didn't know what was important. So uh, what it was doing was harvesting the questions, the questions that people asked of the machine that knew everything were the really interesting part, the relevance, you know, the relevance basically. Reminds me of another story 
Um, I'm glad I read, read science fiction way back in the day, probably mid 70s. Um, uh, this one was uh, competing worlds or something like that. Uh, somebody contrived a really clever um, invention that looked physically impossible to do, you know, and they were showing off, you know, hey, my world is so much better because we've got this invention that, you know, is looks like it's physically impossible, but it's not. We cracked the code. We knew how to do it. And it turned out to be a clever fake. And it was something that, you know, the the people who were like, oh my God, that's awesome, but I don't know how it could be done. They ended up doing it, right? They ended up creating the thing that actually did it instead of the fake thing that that faked it doing it. I have the same story about Caltech, actually. So I went to Caltech for a couple of years. Um, and there was an apocryphal story, I think it's actually true, uh, where a professor put up one of the grand challenges, one of the you know grand unsolved problems in physics or math or something like that every, every uh, year at the end of the semester. Um, and, and one semester, somebody comes back, you know, one of the students comes back and said, I think this is the answer, you know, it was a tough problem, but, and the professor's head explodes, you know, and it was, it was truly the answer to this great unknown, you know, unsolvable problem. Yes, I, I was, I didn't have quite that experience, but I remember a professor giving us an assignment that was a recently solved. <laughs> difficult problem <laughs> okay <laughs> he's really asking us to step up <laughs> i guess i i blew the the main part of the the um the story in in you know presenting the problem the professor didn't say that it was unsolved or unsolvable it's just like a hard problem you know this is an interesting problem i think you guys might enjoy it so if you don't know that it's not solvable maybe you'll solve it yeah the, on the other hand, the fake it tells you make it can backfire, as we're seeing with Theranos right now. <laughs> yeah. The, um... Probably less than it seems like it should. It seems like that should happen all the time, but. Is anybody paying attention to China right now uh, over the last, I don't know, two or three months? It's been a fascination of mine, and certainly um, I've been following it through YouTube. And you know, the algorithm learns that, oh, you want to see things about disasters happening in China, <laughs> financial <laughs> or otherwise. So I just get a lot of them. Um, but um, you know, the leveraged uh, Evergrande or Evergrande Plus, yep. yeah, where it just seems that, um, huh we know that we have to fix this and so we're trying different things and we know that you know we're kind of have this communist kind of reality field where we're not going to say that we messed up but we're going to control and we're going to do control in a way that is heavy-handed and Mm, not kind of cybernetic, the homeostasis kind of Stafford beer running chili kind of thing. We're just going to like take the hammer and go bonk and see what happens. Um, mm, this is, they get to make it on a civilizational scale, which yeah. I'm really interested in what's going to happen and how that plays out across the landscape of human civilization, because this is a, a new territory at that scale. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of weirdness of, uh, you know, here in America. Um, but boy, I, I can say, hey, I don't know the amount of weirdness that's happening in China, but it looks like maximum weirdness. <laughs> It's, yeah, um, my wife and I just recently watched uh, the Chernobyl um, uh, series on, on HBO Max. Um, and then I was reading, somehow we, we got around to kind of the same subject on one of the OGM calls um, and just reading the, the, 
page about Soviet propaganda on Wikipedia is really interesting. Um, but if you think about it, the the 2007-2008 financial crisis also, I mean, you know, in, in one sense, like the way I remember that kind of is, well, we made some compromises and, and we had this clued fix that we applied. But if if I wasn't part of the society that did that kludge fix kind of kind of a not technical fix but a you know a, a, a manufactured fix um I would be kind of thinking the same thing if it wasn't my culture it'd be like okay so these guys have you know there's reality and then there's man, their manufactured view of reality and they're actually not the same <laughs> so it, it happens in the U.S. too but but we think it's clever instead of foolish or something. Foolish or clever, or cleverly foolish. I did enjoy this uh, kind of getting to know your conversation. Um, I have to get to- uh, Off to real work. Yeah, uh, well, um, it's gonna be interesting. I, I've basically, again, hurt myself, been out all week and uh, I got this book. Ah, I, I'm bringing books from home to kind of um, model being old to people here. Um, uh, but uh, there's the Society of Text, kind of an edited um, hypertext social media by Edward Barrett. But this um, handbook of walkthroughs. Well, inspections and something or other technical um, reviews yeah, programs so projects and products we don't know how to do that <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how to do that let me put it that way um so again i've been uh earlier talked about uh, trying to review a design that wants to go into production and the design is is has should have should have been reviewed before it got um, coded and it didn't. And I have to watch my language, be encouraging, clear, and, um, and say, hey, we need to change this process in some way. Um, can you help me do that? And I feel like I'm not up to the task, but I'll try anyway. <laughs> Have a good Friday. Hope to see you next week. Um, uh, I wish I were up to, uh, you know, connecting over the weekend with somebody, but not, not this weekend. Um, not this take weekend. care. Okay. Yeah, good to see you. Bye bye. Let's schedule something eventually. This is this is a wonderful gab session, but I don't think we did much to advance flotilla uh, or anything else. Uh, the I, so, I'm okay with that for what it's worth. Yeah, cool. Uh, I'm I'm a bit uh, driven to. Okay, what what are we trying to exchange exactly? <laughs> I, I will say that um, the the very um, graspable. I've talked to Pete about this before, but not and and maybe Vincent, not you, Mark and Twan. Um, the idea of working with the cultural artifact stuff um, to me is a really useful um, use case, kind of stalking horse for some of the, the facts that interrelate just because it's so tangible. We talked about this with regard to music too, that when you've got stuff of some kind where the artifact in itself is interesting and um you know just to take this example in the chat i mean you you would tag this you know lewis carroll alice in wonderland um pete you know would talk about its relationship to matrix the matrix and i would you know view it as a poster graphic design piece you know who who and when it was who printed it and who designed it, when it was printed, where, um, and all these tags 
being attached to this object in a database and having it show up in different collections and with different imprimaturs of, of expertise loosed upon it is a great way to, to figure out how knowledge sharing can work. Um, and so I, I'm really interested in playing with that. Um, yeah, my, my, my interest is more with abstract objects because sure. it, is, it is more complicated in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah. The, uh, the, they're much less, the identity is, like the identity of the poster is not in question, but it's true that they're still in the tags and the ideas around it, there's plenty fuzziness, right? Yeah. Alice, which Alice? Uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland through a looking glass. Do we count the first uh, facsimile version? Do we count the since you're into imprimaturs? You know, like the complete uh, the complete Lewis Carroll book has the facsimile mm -hmm. kind of written by Lewis Carroll of uh, this first version of the Alice story. Quite different in some in some aspects. Uh, the um, any relation at all to the historical Alice Pleasant Little or not, or how, or? <laughs> um, well, well, making things, you know, these objects obviously are, are very discreetly and completely granular um, and, and the object itself isn't, isn't that fuzzy, yeah. the associations get fuzzy. Um, the the, the denotative cloud, I was, I was saying. What's that? The denotative cloud, as I was saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, the connotative cloud, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, doing, doing this with um, facts <laughs> or, you know, links, articles, um, and, and, keeping their associations as um, available as possible to allow you to go in different directions from them um, is less about determining canonical truth on the surface of it, but at the same time, when you have the decoration of, of tagging and associations and, you know, Marc Antoine saying, this is interesting in this context and Pete saying, this is interesting in that context to somebody who knows neither of you and nor knows your expertise to come in and, and begin to self-generate, um, you know, reputational attributions to you um, seems like a really important component. And I'm, I'm, I, th I think it's relevant to, to what you're doing, Marc-Antoine, Mar and well, what all of us are doing. Um, and I'm just, just really interested in how I can figure out how to, how to interoperate there. Um, the question of reputation is one that it's, it's, it's another layer, but it's one I do worry about a lot, because if you're going to do a global knowledge cartography, the risk, I mean, you don't want to exclude any opinion, no matter how far-fetched, because exclusion is a way for people to lose trust in the system. I said that in the conference. On the other hand, reputation is hard. And I'm, I'm really, really, really interested in what Tetlock is doing for reputation. Like what the, is that? Tet, Tetlock, the, the super forecasters book, you know about mm. it? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 because what, what's interesting about Tetlock is he's designed a way to assign a numerical prediction score to people based on uncertain predictions. And this is really wonderful. Because a lot of people can say, you know, this will happen, this won't happen. And they'll usually be wrong. Uh, and, and, and that's not particularly in interesting. What is interesting is somebody saying, this is somewhat likely, you know, and, and you know, he actually has people give a percentage like, you know. And when those people are obviously trivially never wrong because they're not committing either way. But 
what's a useful measure of prediction quality when you get people to, when you allow people this edging? Uh, and, and, and not only does he design a quality that uh, doesn't reward hedging in general, but does reward precise hedging, accurate hedging, uh, which is really, I mean, both are important, right? You don't want to just, but then he shows that in general, people who hedge are more accurate than non-hedgers which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the, the fox and the hedgehog metaphor, right? Uh, and, and being able to uh, understand why the hedgers are good predictors and have should have a good reputation as understanding their domain. Well, if you want to look at, you know, markets that work that way. Yeah, the prediction markets, uh, yes. Well, but, but, but here's a real market, you know, prediction markets are, I mean, not that that's not a real market in its way. Look at odds makers, look at sports betting, oh, look yes. at the way that, you know, it's a job to say, I'm not, I'm not telling you that this team is going to win the game. I'm telling you that the betting is going to come in 50% above this point and 50% below this point. And, you know, and, and that the, the total that the two teams score is going to be 50, you know, there are 50% odds is gonna be above this point and 50% below. And those kinds of, you know, I, I, just, I just think that's a fascinating real world proven example of how this sort of hedged prediction um, is, is really useful and, you know, proves out over time. Absolutely right. And on the one hand, it's really interesting because obviously some people can make a living that way and that shows that they're good at forecasting. On the other hand, I, I, let, let me be a bit nasty and say the fact that some people consistently make a living that way is predicated in the fact that some people regularly lose money that way. And that means that, <laughs> which means that the, forecasting ability is not evenly distributed, which again is no surprise, but uh, in terms of our general ability to predict the future, it's also saying something. But, but the fact that it's not distributed means that there is something to rank here, there is a scale to rank. Well, and here's another thing that the, the predictive issues as opposed to knowledge sharing for, you know, there, it's one thing to be in the game of winning, you know, cynically, perhaps being a winner in the predictive game, uh, as opposed to knowledge sharing in a positive way to make us better in the proactive beat the predictions way. Like it's easy to, to, I won't say it's easy, but you know, it's, it's one game to say when, when climate change will, will have us all go up and, you know, be cinders. Um, and uh, another to say, what are the ways that we might avoid it and how you know, how do we value these different pieces of data that we all have? If we can give all of us access to all of the data and then all of us access to what, you know, Klaus, you know, thinks matters about these things and what this one thinks matters about these things and attach a negative value to what somebody we've determined ourselves seems to be pretty wrongheaded about this things are important thing you know that that's a different game than the prediction it is. Game. No, 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 absolutely valid point uh i think prediction is a reputation measure but you're right that it's not the only one being able to make things happen is another form of valuation and being able to change the odds is another form of valuation very very valid point the, the, I'm just thinking how much of the difficulty 
of uh, getting consensus on certain things, I wonder is based on the fact that people like the odds making mechanic, which means that they'll want to be antagonistic on the odds that they'll win. Uh, and they're, and they're coming from this this you know monetary gain place as opposed to I mean it's just like it's it, we're very much talking about like kind of market concepts um, of winning and losing the accuracy game but not market the, and reputation uh, ones that friendship like there's reputation. Uh, race also like there's the money race and there, there's the reputation race and, and, and you know uh, so much of the um what's it called um the, the conspiracy theories are based on this notion that you have knowledge that other people don't have access to and that makes you special yeah. and when you go is involved in so many things as a buddhist i can <laughs> hammer that in. Um, well, scarcity also, it, you know, yeah, it's, it's very confusing to me thinking about stuff and information that we have um, abundance on the one hand, um, but uh, particularly when we we're talking about, you know, art and collectibles and, and you know, historical rarities um, value Don't assigned by... Don't get me started by... on NFTs. What's that? <laughs> Don't get me started on NFTs. Well, I know, I know, but... <laughs> But no, no, but, but you're right. It's an absolutely fascinating. That that's something. I mean, we're we're far from flotilla, but it is something that does fascinate me. The scarcity makes perfect sense in for rival goods, and so much of value in the world now is non-rival, and then we have to add artificial mechanisms of scarcity, like NFT, intellectual property all kinds of things to create scarcity where there should be none. And on the, other, on the one hand, I think there should be none. On the other hand, I think you should be able to make a living. That is, exchange your non-rival production for rival goods. I should be able to eat up intellectual production, right? But the, the question of offer and demand on non-rival goods is much more difficult to determine because, and, and, and that way, I don't know, I, I have spoken about, um, value flows and uh, um, sensorica before, all right, were you there? there? There are people trying to track the um, flux of material goods and information and ideas in a way that makes it possible to know what were the inputs of a product, including the intangibles. I think that's really know, important. Do you know, um, I think Lynn Foster, I think that's the Mycorrhizal people, right? What's that? Is that the Mycorrhizal people or something? Um, like I'm just trying to, you know, this is this is the, the peril of being in, in too many Zoom rooms with too many different people. Um, she's somebody who, uh, Vincent has, has met her in a, um, uh, um, it's um, in, a CT, in a CTA space, uh, the Collaborative Technology Alliance. Um, and she's involved in uh, a value flow. They, they have some really interesting um, kind of white paper presentations. So uh, I'd have to, f I'll, I'll see if I can find and share. No, no, I, I, I know who you mean now. That's who I thought it was okay. the right name because my memory was also. <laughs> but yes, the, the, I've been following the value flows work uh, a bit. And more recently, because I think there's enormous value there. Jury is uh, working on uh, tools for thought, not unlike yours, but he's doing it on IPFS and um, one uh, and Orbit DB. And one characteristic of his system, because of his use of Orbit DB, is he can very much track requests and track reads. Like the reads are 
recorded okay. transactions. Mm -hmm. So you know who has consulted what from your record. Right. Which is interesting. Right, right. I don't know if I want to go that far, but it's well, I mean, I think the notion of um, you know, and and this is something that we've worked on and only partially manifested. You know, that the, the recording of the clicked on, read, um, uh, highlighted, commented on um re reposted added to collection as as measures of interaction that even even without knowing how you should value them and how you should value them from one agent relative to another agent like you know my interactions around one subject might be more valuable than my interactions around another subject because of my cumulative interactions and, and credentials or whatever other metrics you'd want to like have. So, you know, to allow people to say, show me the stuff most read in this time period by people with this area of expertise who are in this region or you know and are not white men or <laughs> you know i mean what whatever whatever various things that you would want to filter by to give you a perspective that is valuable in a particular instance that isn't a pure popularity metric and isn't a pure reputation metric um right. uh, interesting yeah but that that does require gathering a ton of data. And then you get into uh, the interaction of that with surveillance capitalism and blah, blah, blah. But, but on the other hand, I think here, I'm not absolutely a fan of Jaron Lenny's work on data cooperatives because I feel it enshrines the commercialization of the self and of attention and surveillance capitalism. But on the other hand, he does have a point that if it's valuable, you should own it. Uh, you should not. That, yeah. that you should own it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really big on the idea. I mean, like my <laughs> kind of digital, right. not utopia, but, you know, sort of like um, something that I think would enable kind of better actions is imagine if you had access and provenance over every bit of data that you generate where you know now it's sort of the other way around where like lots of entities know a lot of things about you that you don't know about yourself um whether it's you know healthcare providers the government facebook you know credit card companies um you just most of the data about you is not in your possession um if you had all that and the ability to use it consciously for transactions that, that, you know, sometimes benefit you, sometimes benefit society, sometimes, you know, benefit someone else, that that, it, that, that is all, um, that it's, The, the surveillance is self-surveillance. It's, you know, it gets into the quantified self and second brain and all those notions, but that you're working with that, you're more powerful um, in, in societal interest and self-interest because of your ability to, to work with these things. Wow. And how that relates to income, you know, and buying that stuff from you, it gets like kind of, complicated and, and potentially mercenary, but at least it's not somebody else deciding. Yeah, the, 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 so, yeah, I agree with you that this being in uh, big infer big corporations hands is deleterious. Uh, the information being purely yours on the one hand makes better sense in one way, but then if you have to buy information for aggregates, it means the aggregates are biased. And they lose value. And I mean, there is social value in having unbiased aggregates. 
for which sure, is public, which is a public good, which would be lost with private ownership, with, with individual ownership as opposed to corporate. I mean, it doesn't exist right now in corporate. Ownership. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about the knowledge about you that um, that is personal, you should sell. Yes, fine. Well, but I mean, if, it's just like, the, and there are also lines of like, is there a public good in there being a census? You know, and and is there yeah, certain there is. of your personal isn't isn't there certain of your personal data that we can you know legislatively agree is available? You know, just the fact that you exist, where you you know just some some that that we set agreed upon limits of what's personal and what's public, and also what's public but anonymized. You know exactly no, and that should be a national conversation yes exactly right. and, and this is why i'm saying i'm not in favor of this being totally under the control of the individual i think we need to find this okay. balance between yeah. there's the individual and you should have anything identifying you should control but any but the aggregate some of them are a public good and they should be legislated uh, in public through public conversation because yeah. There are pros and cons to making anything, even aggregate public, and that's sure. fine. I certainly believe, I can't believe only uh, Estonia has a digital identity that you can use for, for example, online polling, right? It's absurd. I mean, we should all be able to refer, to, to have access to a voting token that is on the one hand grounded in personal identity, on the other hand, anonymized. <laughs> <laughs> that we can use for voting on national polls. Yeah. That should be basic state infrastructure. Uh, it's a totally different project than mine, but oh my God, would it help? Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. And, and, and I love what's happening in the digital identity front, but so much of it is based on the let's keep things anonymous, which I see why and I see the point, and, but we also need something that's grounded in real identity. Yeah. Yeah, and and the 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 idea of um, pseudonymity, selective pseudonymity for a, a, a an identified human, you know, or consciousness or whatever whatever line we want to draw there, um, you know that that there are situations in which the fact that you are a legit being as opposed to a bot or whatever yep. is important, but that you not be identifiable is important. Um, and that reputationally, your lack of, you, the, the fact that you're pseudonymous doesn't, can somehow not, Mm, how to put this, you know, that, that there can be some reputational strictures in certain spaces, agreed upon spaces, that allow you to function um, pseudonymously, but not without consequence, not without responsibility um, right. that accrues to your real life self would be a great, um, you know, I think I, I wish you also you also want to have only I mean only one of you can should be able to vote. You shouldn't end up with a side yeah, yeah, problem. Sure. Sure. Exactly. And and the way that you That's uh, reputation is a good way to mediate that kind of. Mm -hmm. the, I don't know if it's enough, but it, it, this is what I'm saying: absurdum in based in like it's possible to have you know state identity and a shuffle uh, a, a, a cryptographic shuffle function so that you know everybody has one pseudonym, but you know the pseudonyms are grounded in real identity. Or, you know, I mean, people could have more than one pseudonym, you know, for, I mean, it's like, if you are- For, for state what functions, you want one. For other things, you might have a couple. Well, yeah. you're one entity, but in some certain platform or space, you are, you know, first name, last initial, and I am an alcoholic, or, you know, 
here you are in a group of, of abuse survivors and here you are in a group of sports fans and you know all those different contexts exit where, users what's that exit users <laughs> yeah um and, 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 and that way it's true it's you shouldn't have one pseudonym per identity you should have one pseudonym per identity per platform right or for context for context for context and but you know with and this is uh, this is incredibly complicated but to me ideally you know say on a given platform where you might exist in different rooms or spaces or groups pseudonymously and and not pseudonymously that if you were behaving honorably under your own name but just causing mischief all over the place pseudonymously that that would impact your you know your real life legitimacy without yeah. without it being public that i mean your demerits might be public but how you accrued them wouldn't be something like but, that so that you would have some kind yeah of it, it, no, no, it, bad behavior it, it, it's complicated what i would say is this is one context you shouldn't come as two identities you either come as the identified one or as a pseudonymous one uh, you shouldn't have both With, without any attachment to, I mean, like unseen attachment to each other. No, I, one of them, not both. You're not allowed to come in as both. If you come, oh, if you sure, came in, so, sure. yeah, if yeah. you came in pseudonymously, so don't come in person as a person and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to to establish a, a group space where you say, okay, we don't function under real names here because we want everybody. For reasons of, you know, political dissent and persecution, or personal embarrassment, or what, whatever it is, we want people to be able to be candid. This is a pseudonymous space. You know, here are our terms. Like, that's how you function in that space. But your behavior in that space, under the assigned pseudonym, can negatively impact your real world reputation. Otherwise, people just adopt pseudonyms in spaces where they want to cause mischief, and there's no, I mean, as does happen in the real world, in, in, yeah, in digital yeah. space now. Yeah, um, what happens is, yeah, but then that breaks, that means a pseudonym is not real. It's, this is all the, uh, the, the arguments about a backdoor in encryption systems. I don't, you know. Well, it's, I mean, I can see how that could not be if, if you have something as simple as, you know, uh, a demerit that, you know, just, you, don't, you the, the Marc Antoine's profile that has a dozen demerits in it that, most of which were accrued under pseudonyms. You don't know what pseudonyms, what what uh, pseudonyms, and where and why. You just know. You know, Mark Antoine knows. Damn, if I do this enough, it's gonna. You know, my my reputation in my real name world is going to be affected. Um, yeah. I don't know. It. it I'm a bit, I see, I see why you want this. I think it's dangerous in the sure. sense I, I can totally see people uh, creating fake systems to give fake demerits to political opponents, right? Um, the, the, the moment you can associate demerits uh, to a real identity in from a context, you have a risk of this being gained in that direction as well. It's the, the, the question of which identity we're acting upon and interaction between identities is really complex. It's not something I have a I feel I have a solution for. Yeah. I mean <laughs> it's, it's um, and there's so many disadvantages to 
pretty much anything. I mean, yes, there's real crime, and yes, there's real uh, um, criminal states and criminal actors, uh, and, and there's so many ways to game in the system. It's and, and something else that's pointed out also by civil rights activists, which I think is valid, is right now the machinery of pseudonymity is still extremely difficult and obscure. And it becomes more a way for people to fail and to get caught because of this or that obscure technical detail that they didn't master. Rather than really protect people who need the protection, which totally do exist. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm but but we do need we do need to be able to do real polls based on real identity without soft puppets. I think that's one use case that's valid. And um, I think contextual pseudonyms, rounded pseudonyms is one case for that. But connecting that to the real identity, for me, that's a security breach in the pseudonymity. I think that's dangerous. I could be wrong. I'd have the demerit be local. If you want to build a reputation as a good predictor, do it under your real identity, right? That's different. Expertise, expertise should be public anyway. <laughs> Hidden expertise is not exactly useful. The, 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 there is a question of, well, I mean, if you want to build expertise in uh, mafia operations, I don't mind that it's difficult to do so. <laughs> That's not a reputation I want to help build. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the the linking will happen anyways. For example, there's a YouTube channel, Coffeezilla. He he's kind of like a internet investigator of um, increasingly more like crypto type of stuff. But at first, he was starting out with just like fake gurus, like people who would, you know, like create a YouTube account saying, "Hey, take my course to be a millionaire," and then kind of just scam people. And he's transitioned to kind of like doing these like blockchain investigations where because of the blockchain, there's like a trail of like all these like wallets. And so he basically be like, he'll figure out like, okay, this is one person's wallet ID. And then you could see which wallets they've traded with. And so he kind of creates like a mind map of like, this person created like 20 fake wallets so that he can like basically launder money around the blockchain and not have it like tied back to his account. But it's interesting because if anyone tries hard enough, if somebody does something really bad, you can like basically figure it out and link it back to their account, even if you don't require that. And so he like <laughs> kind of cracks these cases and figures out like who did like a pump and dump or who like has been like scamming people by like kind of following the breadcrumbs and the trails online. So I feel like it's like pretty hard to hide, even if you don't aren't required to like link your account with bad reputation to your actual like identity. Well, that, that, that's a very good point. I mean, a lot of so-called anonymization is like the de-anonymization techniques are really good. And a lot of people think they're anonymized and aren't. And that's one problem. Uh, and that's a big problem when you speak about political activism and so on. By the way, I just put a link uh, when you spoke of false gurus, I thought of the Kumari movie. Have you seen that? It's 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 absolutely brilliant movie of this guy who's trying to investigate the guru phenomenon and becomes a fake guru and starts telling people about this mystical experience and meditate and you'll see this blue light and blah, blah, blah. And he spends months with these people, leading them on with this way. And at some point he sees the blue light himself. <laughs> and at some point he tells them, this is what I've been doing. Uh, I've been telling you the world's an illusion and it's amazing because it's film and it's like, he's telling them, you know, everything's an illusion. And, 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 and he's very much hinting at his own illusory nature as a guru and nobody gets it and so in a way he can't say he hasn't lied 
<laughs> and when he does tell, I mean, half of them are so angry with them and don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. And half of them see that, you know, he has told them something about the nature of illusion and truth. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating movie. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a bit of a tangent. But the question of the cryptographic complexity, like, I am so worried about all the Ethereum and DAOs and uh, smart contracts uh, because I feel there's so many opportunities for people to get people into smart contracts that they don't understand. I mean, smart contracts are an extremely complex technical skill. And yes, uh, that way I do think that what uh, David Bovell is doing with a kind of uh, natural language smart contracts is important and interesting, but I really see, uh, uh, let me find that for you. That tech. Uh, uh, your Uh, Sorry, I was muted while I was asking that question, but I think you. Um... So, so, so Lexon is basically a compiler that compiles a restricted natural language subset to smart contracts. And that's interesting because at least it's readable as natural language at first. Uh, but in general, I think smart contracts can be a great way to hook things. Yeah. They scare well, me. I what I was mentioning when I was muted was um, uh, Jim Fournier with um, J Link and uh, and a social content network that he's working on called True.net TRU.net um, is is big on natural language um, JSON based smart contracts for. It's, it's, it's a lot about information provenance. Um, J-Link is, hold on, let me just put the link to that. And, um, oh yeah, you had pointed me to J-Link. That was mm -hmm. interesting. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't fully grasp it, but you know, I, the, the, it makes sense uh, just as, as you're saying about this, that, you know, we come up with ways to to do smart contracts and have the virtues of that without it um, all being, you know, blind trust free. You know, the the whole blockchain um, mm -hmm. un un unlegally enforceable, but but only enforceable by its structural verification um, that that seems like just doesn't feel right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we need humans to educate these things after all yeah. uh, now of course there's a problem there's the agency problem there but still. sure well, i will look at true thank you that's that's interesting and I will there was just at, related to that there was just a the last three days and I couldn't attend, but there was um, uh, the identity, I'm forgetting what it's called, but oh, there, yeah, was, there was the big identity thing. Yes. You yeah. Yeah. To it. Um, I and, decided uh, I couldn't afford it. Yeah. That was, that was actually a blocker for me too. <laughs> it's like, this is really cool. And I'd really like to be part of this, but not to this tune. Um, but uh, they they generate. I mean, I was I downloaded some of the material from their previous conferences, and they will be generating one from this one. And I think it's interesting stuff. Um, Clearly, there, there, there's something in digital identity that's happening, and some of it is extremely scary and dangerous and misguided, and some of it is extremely visionary and forward-looking and needs to be part of the solution. It's going to be very hard to distinguish which is which for a long time. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good point, Vincent. Um, it's it is part. This discussion is particularly random <laughs> and went all over the place. <laughs> we like we like to be able to tag segments. <laughs> That said, it's also been very early long, and I think I may want to. Uh... Say goodbye at this point. Yeah. Um, in the same boat. Um, yes, Vincent, you know, tagging, tagging this video and. You know, even a yeah, transcript, I, I set up a transcript of uh, a Thursday OGM call recently, and you can, uh, it's, uh, I, I used something like Otter, it wasn't Otter, it was Descript and AWS. Um, but anyway, having a, a transcript that you can scroll down like a document and scan for things and say, okay, I want to listen to this part and you click it and you're there. Um, that's pretty good. Um, and you can actually, in, in Descript, probably in Otter, you can actually add comments in that part too. So you could flag the parts that are interesting. I meant to ask you, Peter, so you're using Descript now instead of Otter. Um, did they, they do different things. So Otter just transcribes things. Um, Descript is really uh, for, um, I'm, I'm misusing it a little bit. Uh, the thing that you're supposed to do with trans, uh, Descript is load a video um, and then it will transcribe the, the audio for you and create a, a document. And then you edit the document. Um, you can click a button and remove all the noise words like ums and ah uh and ah. Uh. Um, you can literally copy and copy or delete, you can highlight something and delete it, um, or you can highlight the, if the description, if the transcription is wrong, you can fix it very easily. It's It's got a kind of a keyboard based workflow that takes a little bit to, to get used to, but once you're doing it, you change the case, uh, if it if it guessed the capitalization of a proper name wrong, you just change that. Um, if it got a word wrong, you just change that. But you can literally also delete a few words if somebody started saying something and then backed up and, and said it the right way, you can just delete the words. Every time you make a delete um, on the document, it does the same thing to the video. And then even better than that, um, they don't actually edit the video, they keep the video as a static object. And then the video that you're watching is a set of pointers, kind of like a nonlinear video editing of, uh, you know, into the, into the actual video. So you can rearrange video or you can take that document and copy out just the best parts and paste it in another document. Um, and without having, it, it didn't do anything to the video, it just changed the pointers. You can create a highlight, a highlights reel or something like that, or just clip out one conversation or whatever, rearrange it a little bit if you need to, and it's a new thing. And you push publish and it prints it. Um, uh, uh, an advanced feature that they've got, and I think you can only do this for your own voice, but you can also type new text in. So you say, oh, I was doing the screencast and I forgot to add this one little part. I'll just type it in. Um, and they synthesize your voice um, uh, into the gap there. Um, when I did that, it was you know a few months ago, six months ago. It, you could tell that it was warbly and stuff like that, but it was. You could also tell that it was your voice. They do some other fancy stuff with the audio. They have something they called studio recording. I think um, I haven't tried it, um, but uh, for that synthesized voice, they actually match the noise print um, and the timbre of your room kind of. Um, they've also taken that technology and they've made it so that they can clean up an audio recording of yourself to, to sound like you were in a studio rather than wherever you were. So Descript is, is a, is a transcript-based video editing solution. Um, uh, usually what you do is you give them a video, you wait a little while, they, they add the transcript. Um, the transcription costs per minute and you have to, their pricing model is such that you set how many minutes you're going to use this month and you you keep that many num number of minutes so if you're not doing a lot of it like i'm doing i use it once in a while um i i have a low number of limit uh, minutes then i run out of them i don't want to pay more for a higher level of minutes because i'm not going to use it this month or well, maybe use it next month they do a cool thing i don't even know why this works but um 
I can do an, an AWS machine transcription and then import it for free. Um, uh, so I cheat uh, their pricing model. I buy, you know, the minimum number of minutes I can get, and then I splice in the uh, AWS transcription. Um, there, so Otter also has an integration with Zoom so that an Otter transcript actually knows your Zoom name and it identifies you, you know, per channel kind of. Um, AWS and I presume Descript uh, do speaker, um, speaker recognition, which works pretty well, except for short snippets of things or when two people are talking or something like that, you'll get a, a misidentification. So anyway, probably more than you wanted to know. Descript is amazing. It's super fun. The, and the, the use case is really short, little like uh, two, three, five minute, 10 minute, you know, I'm going to send you, I, I want to show you this feature. Here's how this feature works. And instead of trying to practice the script and then do a perfect take, you just do the first take and then you can fix it all up um, by editing the, the transcript wow. that, that got created. And for that, it's brilliant. For a one and a half hour OGM call, um, it's so big and the, it takes so long to kind of load everything and sync everything. It's, it's really, um, it, the overhead to set up is really a pain. Once, you're, once you've got it set up, editing a video is pretty easy, but um, it's, it's really meant for shorter things, you know, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I was wondering if I should edit my, uh, I tried putting my uh, Hopper Knowledge Seminar in order, but it's the free plan, so it's cut after 40 minutes. Yeah. I could just cut the video and give it the other half and <laughs> let it do it. But um, the, the script is super fun to use. And the, the thing to try it with is not a long uh, meeting, but a short, you know, I'm going to do a screencast of a, an idea for two minutes. And then it's brilliant. It's super fun, um, okay. super generative. And, right. and so much fun that it's like, oh, now I want to, what else can I talk about that I want to record and, you know, share with the world because it's so easy and fun. I, I'm, I'm really, I, since you've been talking about it, I've been so excited. I mean, I've looked at it, but I haven't actually done it yet. And I'm, but I just keep thinking about it. <laughs> really it's, it is super fun. The other, mm -hmm. the other thing to know mm -hmm. is it takes like an hour to kind of figure out your your fingers and the editing flow and and all the commands and stuff like that it's not it doesn't quite roll out of the box but after you know after 20 minutes you're kind of okay with it and after 40 minutes you're getting like to to pretty good with it but it it takes a little while to get good at the flow but then the flow that they designed is built to do lots of it so that's why that it's hard you know to start with is it conducive to doing things that um involve um, graphics and screen, screen shares and, and other video? It, the... it doesn't care what the video is. And, and actually their main use case is screen recordings, I think. Um, right. It'll actually do the screen recording for you for uh, natively. It does native screen recording. Um, so it doesn't care what the video is. Um, it has nothing to do with the video. Uh, it cares about the audio. Put in Tied, you know, like let's say you've done a screen recording with a voiceover and then you've edited it into something you like, but then you want to go back and put, you know, headings, you know, into I, I have not yeah. actually tried that. I think it would, I think it would work pretty well. Um, but you can lift it, you know, lift the finished video that they've got and put it in um, uh, Premiere or whatever, you know, yeah. if, if you're used to using another tool for post production stuff, you can do that too. I, I have no, not done real, like that kind of post-production stuff in Descript. I haven't even tried. Yeah. I mean, now okay, that I, I, need to try it, I guess if you, if you recorded um, your title cards at the end of the video and then- just I was, I was thinking that I wasn't gonna suggest it, but you, <laughs> you could totally do that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, well, I should run. Even so. Yeah, we should we should all run. Uh, just what you said about the you never have any idea what I'm getting into. I think that the hack MD is published with the video, right? So it should give uh, an idea of what to. Yeah, hack MD it doesn't match the video. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> bye bye. Cheers. Thanks all. Cheers. Awesome yeah. call. Bye.